Good. Okay. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. As Janet said, it came about because I did a short, very short talk um, to BSBI about plant identification around the world. And that arose because I'd had a conversation with um, this officer of the BSBI. And during that time, she volunteered that she did identification lessons and that she had, if you like, a hierarchy of um, ways of doing things. In other words, there were some ways of identification that were to be encouraged and better than others. This was rather contrary to my experience because in the last 15 to 20 years, I've spent as much time botanizing outside Britain as I have inside. And my experience was you have to use whatever comes to mind because um, you can't rely on the sorts of things that we can in Britain. So let me start by talking about, first of all, the British and Irish experience. And we have to start 25,000 years ago when Britain was at the, <clears throat> in the glacial maximum, covered by sheets of, of ice. Um, the rest of it was tundra and there were woolly mellus and giant deer prowling around. And there were possibly some remnant flora, but really most of the flowers which had lived on um, the what we now call Britain and Ireland um, had been completely killed off in the very long period of uh, glaciation uh, and we were now waiting if you like for the melt and that happened about 10 to 12,000 years ago and we know from the pollen record which plants came over first and those plants which we've all identified uh, are now known as our native British flora. Much much later um, men came along built cities and towns and went abroad exploring and brought back both on purpose and by accident various plants for medicinal purposes and purposes and for gardens and those eventually wild. and uh, is anybody hearing a buzzing sound here? Yeah. Has somebody got not got their um Is. All right, okay, it's gone now. <laughs> the, uh, the, the introduced species then um, became as big as, the, as our flora. And what we did was we had really studied them. In, in Britain, we became one of the first countries to study flora in, the flora in depth. And you can get a whole book which will cover virtually all the things you're likely to see, such as New Flora of the British Isles by Clive Stace, or if you can if you can afford it, the five volume series by Peter Sell and Gina Murrell um, covering flora of the break, Great Britain in much greater detail. But even that is only touching the surface because you've got a whole lot of monographs. They're the excellent monographs by BSBI. And more recently, we've had some wonderful monographs um, with pictures, uh, photographs, really good quality photographs and descriptions of some of the really difficult groups. So it's, it's one of those things where we now know that um, we haven't had very long for our flora to establish itself, but we have been studying it in depth for a long time. And so we have a huge literature to go at. You could argue we have the most studied flora in the world. So how big is our flora? Well, according to Wikipedia, we've got about 2,500 species, but they do only include, if you like, major species. They don't go into any detail. Stace describes 4,800 taxa, but he uses, he actually looks at hybrids and he looks at subspecies as well. And in Cell and Murel, they get up to 8,027 because they look at subspecies, they look at varieties, they look at formi, they look at um, all kinds of others like apomix, which I'll come to in a minute. And the one I do like to quote is not a book at all. It's a spreadsheet produced by BSBI in 2007, BSBI 2007 spreadsheet, and they actually listed about 9,500 plants. But that did include some species that say had arrived in 1933, had been seen until 1937 and never again. So it was really like a list of all the plants we've ever seen in Britain and we've ever known about. Well, how do we compare with other sorts of countries? For instance, um, you can get tours to go and see the wonderful flowers of South Africa. Well, they've got about 2,000 species, and I'm not talking about um, subspecies here. They've got 2,000. 20,000. Uh, sorry, 20,000, yes. <laughs> United States, about 17,000. Europe's much more complicated because it depends what you define as Europe. But say 9,000 to 11,500, and it rather tends to put poor old 
Britain and Ireland at the bottom of the pole, doesn't it? So I guess if I'd had the figures for Iceland or perhaps Finland, we might have had uh, uh, countries which, because of the same reasons as ours, ha have had uh, fewer flowers establishing themselves uh, in, in those countries. But um, bottom of the pole is definitely Antarctica with Descampsia and Colobanthus quintensis <laughs> as the only species. So if you go to the outer islands and see those, you've seen the entire flora. So why are the variations there? Well, because we describe species, subspecies, varieties, forming hybrids, and apomictic species, which I'll go to in, the, in a minute. In other words, we go into a lot of detail in Britain. We really do look at um, slightly, if you like, the slight differences. We, we discuss the differences between um, Dactylorhiza incarnata subspecies and whether they really exist or not, that sort of thing. But apomixis, what is that? Well, this is the definition, the asexual formation of a seed from the maternal tissues of an ovule, avoiding the process of meiosis and fertilization, leading to embryo development. It's one of those definitions that you'd wish you'd never asked about. But what it really means is that the plants with this particular characteristic uh, clone themselves. Uh, if you take an example of a dandelion and blowing the seeds on a dandelion clock, every one of those seeds will be identical to uh, the, every other one and identical with the parent. So you've got um, plants which produce identical, um, identical clones, and we, we know them as a sort of shorthand as microspecies. Now, how many of these do we have? Well, we've got more than a thousand, and some of them are actually quite rare. So if you think about the Wikipedia number, if you add the, um, the thousand or so um, apomictic species, now you're beginning to build the numbers up. And then, of course, you've got the other ones. Um, taxonomist warning. This happens occasionally on social media. Just remember, there is no taxonomic ramp called, called microspecies, but it's one of those terms that's become commonly used and it's even in STACE edition four. So I think it's okay for us to use it really. So here's some examples of these um, apomictic species. On the left-hand side, Sorbus devoniensis, the Devon white bean, which grows in Devon, you're not surprised by that. And a much more recent discovery in the last few decades decades, Sorbus whiteiana, white, uh, uh, white bean, and there are a few experts in this area who are constantly um, bringing to our attention new species to science, and they write papers about them, name them, and so I think in the Cell and Murel edition they had 73 species, but since then there have been others produced. And then we have the dandelions. This is if you look very carefully at the bottom here, you can see one leaf, and that leaf is very much cut away. Uh, I wouldn't have known it, but this is a species and it's actually Taraxicum lachistophyllum, cut-leaved dandelion. Um, I could never have identified that, but our leader was an expert and we were around, walking around Teesdale and he immediately um, brought to our attention that there are many of these dandelions and in fact, Sel and Murel have 232 described in their book. This was this what there's a bramble. They are the same sort of uh, the same sort of uh, idea. There are many brambles, and I must confess that confess that when I've been shown these by bramble experts, on the whole, they all look the same to me. Our bramble expert told me this one is definitely a species. So when we were on the trip with him, we immediately asked, "Then, okay, what's its name?" And he said, "It hasn't got one. It hasn't got one because nobody's had time to write it up." But it's definitely a species and it only grows here and we happen to be in a place near Bolton called Rivington Pike. So he said, I just call it the Rivington Bramble. So its name would be this, Rubus Spur, Spur because it has no species name, Rivington Pike. And the reason I've highlighted that is because it's an example of a phrase name. In places which have much richer flora than Britain, phrase names are common because people will discover species, but simply there aren't enough academic people to write the whole thing up and name it give its habitat, its characteristics, and prove that it's actually a bramble or pl plant that's different from anything else. So that was that is actually quite, a, if you like, an interesting departure. I don't, I'm sure there must be other rubus that are in that um, category with phrase names, but we tend not to come across them in Britain. And then you can't neglect the hawkweeds because although there are about 354 brambles, there are 412 of these. And I've given you examples of two here. On the left-hand side, Hyracium cambricum, the Welsh hawkweed. On the right-hand side, one I'm rather proud of, we discovered it 
on our way up Colmore to look at the Norwegian mugwort. And um, I used one of those glossy um, monographs that I described about alpine hawkweeds to identify it. And it came out as alpine hawkweed itself. And I checked it with an, a hawkweed expert and he concurred. And it is the one and only hawkweed I've ever identified on my own. So I'm rather proud of it. There are 412 of those, as I said. So when you start to add them up, we're talking an awful lot of these species and we call them micro species because there are only minute differences between them. So you really do have to be an expert in telling the difference, but people do. And even now on, there is now a Facebook page devoted to dandelion um, identification, something I never thought I'd see. There are also groups that are only just being uh, delineated. And here is one. This is a photograph I took in Cressbrookdale in Derbyshire. And I would say that was a photograph of Goldilocks buttercup, not Goldilocks buttercups, um, Ranunculus auricomus. But I have to label it this way. This means Ranunculus auricomus. SL means sensulato in the broadest <laughs> sense. Because for all I know, there could be more than one Goldilocks buttercup in that group. And they're just being worked on. In fact, one of our members, um, Dr. Leslie, uh, did the taxonomy of Ranunculus auricomus for his PhD thesis in 1979, and it was seen to be a great contribution to sorting out this complicated group. And as a result of that, in 1920, when they really needed to rename one, they named it after him, and he now has a plant, Ranunculus leslianus, named after him. So there we are, summary of the bottom. We've still got a poor flora recovering from the Ice Age. We've got as many introductions as natives. Total numbers of plants vary because it depends whether you inc include the apomix, the hybrids, the subspecies, and so on. And so that's why you get such hugely different numbers. And of course, it's possibly the most studied flora of the world with this huge botanical literature. And that botanical literature makes the British, British flora feel much bigger than it actually is. You could spend a lifetime studying British botany and you would not be an expert in all the areas. There's so much to learn, but People like to see other things. And so let's go to the Mediterranean. Just a short trip away to the Mediterranean lowlands and you'll need a book. We don't have anything like stace to go with us because we're now talking about a much, much bigger flora. But here's two that you can sometimes find. The one on the left deals with the lowland plants, the one on the right with the upland plants and they're separated out nicely. But naturally you have to be aware they don't cover everything. In fact, they barely cover probably 30, 40% of the plants that you'll see. So what sort of things can you find there that cause snags when you're applying your British botanical skills abroad? Well, the first one I want to introduce you to is in Orchidaceae, and that is the Ophrys genus, the bee orchids. We have a few bee orchids in Britain. We've got bee orchid itself. We've got the early spider, the late spider. We've got the fly orchid. But Europe itself is the home of the Ophrys genus. There are more there than anywhere else. And so I've chosen six here just to illustrate that you can see some of them, they're very distinct from each other. Um, you, you would be able to tell Bombyliflora, for instance, from this Ophrys severgodes subspecies mammosa, um, which is a relative of our early, early spider orchid. And there's nothing really like the mirror orchid, Ophrys speculum, uh, uh, and you can usually tell uh, Ophrys tenthreadinifera, the sawfly orchid. But Scolopax, Ophrys scolopax, which is the woodcock orchid, don't ask me why, has quite a lot that have different sorts of markings on this main part, which is called the labellum, similar with Ophrys cochii, and it begins to get confusing. So what you need is a book which will guide you. And there is one. There's a book about the European orchids written by a Belgian botanist, and he's got very good photographs, habitat descriptions, descriptions of the plants and so on. And so you've got a good chance of actually identifying which one it is that you're looking at, even though there are very, very many more in Europe than there are in Britain. The snag with it is that he has doesn't like subspecies and he's promoted a lot of um, species like this one to full species rank. If you're going to do that, if you're going to rename a plant, you really do have to write a paper about it and put your case, but he hasn't done that. So if you like, many of the orchid experts dispute his names. So you've got an excellent book here, which will allow you to identify the species, but the names are in dispute. So you'll have to work hard at working out which one you want to use. However, 
they are used a great deal. And they're used a great deal because if you're running a trip abroad, a botanical trip for commercial purposes, one of the great things to be able to say is you're going to see a lot of orchids because orchids uh, really do attract attention more than any other family. So if you advertise your trip saying, we will see 25 species of orchid, that's very attractive to people. Actually, according to the experts, you're going to see nine species and 16 subspecies. But in his book, they're all species. So that becomes uh, a way of using his book to their advantage. In fact, some rather cynical botanists have called it that tourist taxonomy because it suits their needs. So that is an example of what happens when you go abroad. All of a sudden, there's one particular genus which has got an awful lot more in it that you're used to and you're going to have to work hard to identify it. The other thing that happens is you find plants which are actually quite rare in Britain, but really um, they're, not, they're not rare at all on the continent. And here's an example. This strange looking thing is a birthwort. And this one is Aristolochia biatica. And uh, you find them growing on waste ground and around hedges. It's not difficult to find them on the continent at all. We've just got a few introduced species in this country. And they were, um, they were used in old days as a herbal medicine. Um, according to the doctrine of signatures, which you may know about it, well, where if a plant looked like something, then you could use that plant to cure ill. So if it looked like a leg, you could use it to cure something on your leg. Well, this one is supposed to look like a uterus. So it was used to uh, help people, uh, help women who were in childbirth. And I don't know what they did with it. They probably made a poultice or something like that. And uh, many, many different countries came to the same conclusion. And it was uh, used uh, very widely. And on the continent in particular, it wouldn't be difficult because they had plenty of the different species there. Even though it's rare in Britain, it's common there. We now know actually that um, Aristolochia species, species contain Aristolochic acid, which is both poisonous, carcinogenic, and nephrotoxic. So apart from the fact that it poisons you, gives you cancer, and kills your kidneys, it's probably quite all right for you. So as well as that, as well as plants which are introduced into Britain and rare, we also have plants which are native to Britain, but you really do have to hunt for them. And in the northern forests of Scotland, if you hunt carefully, you might be lucky to find this, which is Linnea borilla borealis, the twin flower. But you do have to hunt. And I have to say that um, I've hunted and failed to find it. And eventually I chose to get directions from somebody before I found my first one. But this one was only half an hour from the center of a Swiss town, which was at about 5,000 or 6,000 feet. So at that height, the climate was probably the same as the northern forests. And so now we're getting plants which are terribly rare in Britain, but much commoner abroad. Um, I alluded to that in a previous talk where we talked about the Snowdon lily, which is only on ledges in Snowdonia in Britain, but in the Swiss Alps, you can find it all over the place. So it is actually relatively common. So common plants in Europe can be rare in Britain. You can get huge numbers that cause you a confusion. And the other sort of confusion is going to be illustrated by this. But the first time I came across this was actually in, uh, in the Gargona, which was an orchid trip. I was photographing all the plants I could see and I came across one particular crucifer, member of the Brassicaceae, which had most beautiful golden flowers and glossy green leaves. It was a perfect shape. And so I asked the leader what it was, because I'd said, I've never seen anything like this at all. It really is the most beautiful crucifer. Charlock, he said, it's Charlock. Well, it was nothing like the Charlock that grows in Britain. Charlock in Britain is not something you would regard as being one of the great beauties of our flora, but it really did look absolutely gorgeous um, in, in Italy. And this is illustrated by these plants as well. These are gentians. The one on the left-hand side is taken on Ben Laws, and the one on the right-hand side is near the Montrach Glacier in Switzerland. And they're both examples of gentian, Gentiana nivalis. The one on the left-hand side is about two to three centimeters tall. The one on the right-hand side is six to seven centimeters tall with narrower petals. And to be honest, you really wouldn't have mixed the two up. You would have thought they were separate species, but they aren't, they're the same. Next lesson, things grow differently in different climates, even if they are the same species. Even when you see them 
um, many, many times in Britain. They all look much the same, but when you go abroad, very, very much different. In addition to that, to make things a little bit more complicated, there are habitats in Europe which we can't have in Britain. We don't have. Our, our island is simply too wet to have habitats like this. And this is the only formally identified desert region of Europe. Um, it's near Almeria and the rainfall is so low and the sunshine is so high that it is formally classified as a desert region. And it's populated, if you look at that hillside, by what look like cacti, and that's exactly what they are. And these are actually introduced cacti that Opuntia ficus indica, um, indica, prickly pear in the Cactaceae from Mexico. The sunshine is so good, it's so dry, the cacti think they're in Mexico, and they've even become quite invasive in one or two parts. But it does mean that in that part of the world, you can find some dry valleys which have got plants in them that only grow there and nowhere else. If you like there, that would be the equivalent of us going to the top of a Scottish mountain to find one of our Arctic alpines. And there you can find these very rare um, dry desert plants growing in Europe. Finally, the, the, um, the thing that can, if you like, fox you is what I would call boring plant syndrome. And here it is. This is a photograph I took of a plant in southern Spain, and it wasn't in any of the books. I couldn't find it. I tried all the tricks I know online, but I still couldn't really identify it, although there was something familiar with it. And so I uh, eventually asked my friend Peter Jepson if he had any idea what it was, and he studied it for about a week and came back to me and said, not only do I not know what species it is, I don't know what genus it is, and I don't know what family it is either. So we were both stumped and we hawked it around to various botanists and eventually we found why we really struggled with it because it turned out it was a member of the Euphorbiaceae. And we tend to associate Euphorbiaceae, not unnaturally, with Euphorbias, the genus Euphorbia, with its milky sap and its very distinctive uh, reproductive parts. Uh, but this is not that. This is actually a Mercurialis. This is Mercurialis tomentosa. So the two plants that we've got that are a bit like this are Mercurialis perennis, dog's mercury, and Mercurialis annua, annual mercury. And now you perhaps see what reminded you, because it's got the anthers protruding out like Mercurialis perennis, dog's mercury does. But that was a clue that what happens is that a plant that isn't terribly outstanding will not necessarily be in the flora that you've got because the people who are actually designing that flora know that they can't cover everything. So they're selecting the plants for those books. And the ones that they're selecting are the ones that are going to be predominantly attractive and interesting to the punter who's going to take that book off the shelves and take it with them to Europe. So poor old Mercurialis tomentosa is not going to make it. And so you're going to have plants which we would regard as interesting because we look at details in Britain, but on the continent, um, you would only find it if you looked in, in uh, an appropriate book uh, for the area or in Flora Europea or something like that. So now let's take a trip now to outer Europe, to areas where they've got richer flora, much richer even than the Mediterranean, which is pretty rich compared with Britain. And the two I've chosen are Turkey and the Caucasus. And uh, I remember being on a trip with a man who had written several books about uh, the, the Near East and uh, the flowers and, of, of the Near East. And he, I asked him which, was the, which were the two most, which were the most floriferous places he'd been to. And he said, the two best places I've been to are, are the Carpathians and the Caucasus. So um, when a trip came up to the Caucasus, um, yes, I was off there. And they're about 6,400 plants, loads of endemics. The bit that is a bit difficult is actually included in this bit about the countries because it covers southern Russia, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, and one or two others. Armenia and Azerbaijan are at war with each other. Belarus is not a terribly nice country to go to. Um, I've not even mentioned Chechnya, which is on there, and southern Russia and Georgia are the places where you'll sometimes find trips able to go there and you can go with some security. But it's worth it. Uh, the gentleman was right. I've seen, I've seen flowery meadows extending to the horizon with delphiniums and lilies and hundreds of different species just all over the place. And you, you can tell by the look of it that they've been like that for hundreds of years, undisturbed by man or beast. There were no grazing animals. 
at all. And Turkey then is an even more interesting place because it hasn't been botanized that much. It's only re relatively recently that Turkish botanists have got to grips with their absolutely splendid flora. And they now know they've got about 11,000 species. It's a botanical hotspot and about a third are endemics. This means, of course, now we're talking about um, it, it, something that's the opposite of Britain, where ours is very, very well studied. In Turkey, it's not well studied. And so you're going to be, struggle a little bit with um, knowing what you're looking at. To compare, Germany and France, 6,000. Flora Europea describes 11,500 species. Well, Turkey's got 11,000 by itself, so it can't really cover that. So let's have a look at some of the plants you might get. And I've chosen these three <clears throat> to start off with because certainly the one on the left-hand side, many people in Britain would immediately say, yes, that's a good example of an Orobanchi. Gross Hymiae only grows in the Caucasus, so you won't see it anywhere else. You could well be stumped by the plant in the middle though there, Rhynchochorus elephas, seems to have little yellow elephants sticking out of the top. And if you look at the leaves, you're not given too much clue about what they might be. On the right hand side, you've got a plant that looks like a nasturtium on a pole. And do they have anything in common? Because it doesn't look like it, not from what we know from British botany, but they are actually all members of the Orobankesi. And this is the, the other thing that happens with the rich flora, is that the rich flora expands the number of genera that there are in particular um, families, and you may not have come across them before, so you could easily, uh, if you like, find yourself a bit stumped by the plant that you saw. Do there, are there any books? Yes, there are. But if you go to southern Russia, you're not surprised to find that they're written in Russian. Fortunately for us, many of us carry around our smartphones, and there are um, apps by Google which allow you to focus on the page in Russian and read the translation in English. It's not very good English, but it gives you a gist of what the plant is and, and what they're saying about it. The only difference is that what you find is that an awful lot of the uh, names are out of date. They don't seem to have kept up with the taxonomical changes in Europe as a whole. Moving on to Turkey, uh, whether you're a botanist or not, you could be a horticulturalist and immediately identify these. On the, on the right hand side, I think many people would recognize that as a member of the onion family, Allium akaka. It's an alpine and it's only a few centimeters tall, but nevertheless, it's recognizable using your botanical or horticultural skills. And similarly, no question about it, the two on the right hand side are both tulips, Tulipa armina and Tulipa julia. And the thing that strikes you about those is they do look very much the same. And when you look in detail, you can't find many. Well, you can't find any differences of significance above ground. And when I asked our expert about it, she said, how do you distinguish these two? She said, it's very simple, you dig them up. You dig them up and you have a look at the bulbs and it's the structure of the outside of the bulbs that tells you the difference between these species. Well, that is not something that's part of the British botanical experience. We don't go around digging up plants because we don't need to, but not only that, it's illegal anyway. So that was a little bit of a surprise. In Turkey too, they have, um, other, they have plants which we know about in Britain, and these are our three native milk vetches. On the left hand side, Astragalus glycophilus, wild licorice. On the right hand side, uh, Astragalus danicus, and in the middle, Astragalus alpinus, the very rare alpine mi uh, milk vetch, which is on about four sites in Britain. Perhaps you, like me, have struggled up the scree slopes and corry fee to find the patch there, which is only about 100 feet below an eagle's nest and found yourself shouted at by birdies who don't think you should be up there looking at plants. But <clears throat> that, that genus is also represented in Turkey. And here are three of those examples, Cancellatus, Fabatius, and Lineatus. So what's special about those? Well, it's an absolutely huge genus. There are 444 astragalus species in Turkey, 197 are endemic. But what it means is that you've got, unless you can find a monograph which really does explain in detail the difference between all of these, you've got very little chance of understanding what the particular species is that you're looking at. You might get it down to genus level, you might know it's an astragalus, but unless it's terribly distinctive, really, it, it, it's, it's quite hard. I've got about 30 pictures of astragalus species and very, very little chance of identifying most of them because I don't think that monograph that I really want has yet been written. 
So you can find a bit like the Ophrys uh, genus in Europe generally, that you can find something which is absolutely huge as a genus and causes a lot of difficulty in identifying. In addition, you can find plants which look nothing like you've seen before. And this is an example of um, a plant which the Turkish botanists call Rindera. Rindera albida and Rindera lanata are uh, found in the mountains, um, but a lot of botanists say, no, they're not Rindera, they're actually Cineglossum, which is interesting because we do have a Cineglossum in Britain, and this is it, hound's tongue. Cineglossum officinale is in Burriginaceae. So let's have a look at those and see if your skills at knowing something about our Cineglossum would help you knowing this one. Well, that's the Alpine in Turkey. There's ours. There's the Alpine in Turkey. There's ours. Can you see the, can you see the similarity between the two? Neither can I. And that's one of the problems that actually what you get to know is that some of the plants that you are you now find a part of a genus that perhaps you thought you knew look very very different indeed there are books which will help you and this one's even got a picture of a rindera on the front of it and this one covers about four thousand of the flowering plants which is about 37 percent of the flora which is actually quite good but it really doesn't get anywhere near the numbers of astragalus that you might find but there are also monographs covering bulbous plants and there are descriptions as well as excellent photographs which will help you. So increasingly there are books which can help you in this, um, in, with this particular flora which is really being uh, studied more and more these days but which hasn't been studied hugely in the past like the British flora. So let's move towards some warmer climates. And now we're going down south off the coast of Africa to see two very popular holiday destinations, one of which is Madeira. Now there aren't a, really, you're so far south now that you're not really likely to get any kind of a frost in the winter. So if any of the plants in people's gardens escape and can compete in the wild, they'll establish themselves and they won't be killed off in any winter months. In fact, let's face it, we go to Madeira and the Canaries in the winter because it's nice, it feels like summer to us. Acheranthes asperis from India, Ipomea from Central America, and Misamrianthum cordifolium from South Africa. And they are very much at home in the flora of Madeira. As well as that, you've got plants you would immediately recognize. And this one, I think if you were not a botanist, but just a gardener, you would immediately say, that looks like a stock. And you'd be right, because it is. It's Matiola madarensis, and it's a Madeiran uh, endemic. Similarly, if you go to the Canaries, you find the same sort of thing happening. Plants from South America, Central America, and Mexico are to be found plentifully in the wild because they can establish themselves and they don't get killed off. Um, but they do have, as well as that, they do have natives. And again, you'd, you're using your botanical or your horticultural skills, you'd probably immediately recognize that as being a cistus. And you'd be right, and it's an endemic, cistus symphytifolius of the Canary Islands. So your skills are still working uh, to some extent, but you do actually have to be aware of finding that there are genera that are simply too big or too complicated for you to, uh, for you to um, be able to use and be able to get to a species level. So now I'd like to go to an awful long way away to Australia. Um, Australia itself is an island continent, as you know, and I don't know how long ago, hundreds of millions, something like that. It was part of a supercontinent called Gondwana land. Um, one by one, the various continents split off from it, South America, Africa. <laughs> the last to leave. And it moved north. But it moved north so far that in the last ice age, it was too far north, that is to say, too near the, uh, the, the, the tropics, for it to be affected very much by the glacial period. So, although it's a bit disputed, perhaps some of the mountains in the east at the top had a little bit of glaciation. A lot of people say there was no glaciation whatsoever in Australia during the last glacial period, which means that when Britain was covered in kilometer thick ice sheets and mammoths were rolling around and we had tundra, Australia just had a little bit of bad weather. And their plants were evolving in the, in the way they'd done for hundreds of years, hundreds of thousands of years in response to that. Um, 
And if you like, it was a continuum which we haven't seen in Britain. In fact, it's one of the reasons why sometimes botanists abroad can poke fun at British botanists saying, you don't really have any natives at all in your country. Everything's introduced. After all, the oldest plants you've got are only 12,000 years. That's just yesterday in our terms. So Australia, it's got about 25,000 vascular species altogether. Shouldn't be too surprised, Australia's huge. It would cover most of Europe. But it's got about 11,000 in Western Australia, which is a botanical hotspot. And the precise number there is exact because they do keep a proper count. It's got 1,000, over 1,000 alien species, which uh, Australian botanists call weeds. Their definitions are different from ours. If a weed is a plant growing in the wrong place, they have defined the wrong place as the whole of Australia, and therefore anything from outside growing in Australia is a weed. And it's said with a sneer. And one of the reasons is because weeds can be incredibly invasive in, uh, in Australia because the climate is so good. And um, we haven't anything, uh, really, I've never seen anything as invasive. I've seen, obviously, like you have, um, the, um, I've seen some species on riverbanks like Himalayan balsam, mile upon mile of that in late summer, um, completely swamping all our native vegetation. But in Western Australia, I've seen field upon field extending to the horizon and to the left and to the right and having to drive for two or three kilometers before it disappeared, all with uh, non-native plants from South Africa. So they, they are very fussy about that. And it's one of the reasons why you, um, when, you're, when you go to Australia, um, you find there are dogs sniffing around and uh, people assume that they're sniffing for drugs. They're sniffing for food and they're sniffing for plants. That's what they really don't want you to bring in. But they've got about a thousand of them with assigned phrase, name, phrase names like that Rubus species that I showed you early on, the Rubus Rivington Pike. And there are over a thousand which they know are species but haven't been assigned proper names. Perhaps the most significant uh, statistic though is about 1,200 plants pollinated by birds, mammals, bats or lizards, mostly by birds though. And that really is the biggest in the world. There's no other place that has so many. A bit of revision. These are plants from Britain. And the one on the left hand side, Mentha aquatica water mint, yellow archangel, Lamium galeobdilon, on the right hand side, the one with the stinky leaves if you cross them, Stachys sylvatica, hedge woundwort. And they're all members of a familiar family. They have nettly sort of leaves, square stems. And when you see plants like that, you tend to know where you stand. Yeah, that's a good example of how we've, if you like, established our pattern finding in Britain. Do they have any plants of the same family in Australia? Yes, they do. This is Western Australia. And these are just from Western Australia, Dicrostylis of Globiflora, Cyanostegia angustifolia, Lachnostachys eriobotria, and Hemiphora elderi. And the only one you might recognize is Hemiphora elderi looks as though it could be a furry cousin of a flock, the foxglove, which I think, I think may be in Plantagenaceae now, but these are all members of the dead metal family, all in Lamiaceae. But when you look at these plants here, which are shrubs, and you see these little leaves here, and these tiny little gray ones here, they look nothing like the Lamiaceae that we know in Britain. Our pattern finding skills for that particular family really aren't too much use. Similarly, you can find this uh, particular family, fennel and hogweed. And do they have those in Australia? Yes, they do. On the one on the left hand side, really at first glance, looks as though it might belong to Asteraceae. And the one on the right hand side, very architectural indeed, and Xanthosia rotundifolia, the Southern Cross. And they're all in the carrot family, all in APAC. So again, our typical pattern finding uh, skills that we have learned in Britain are not necessarily working now we've gone so far away from the Northern Hemisphere. In addition, you've got families that don't occur in the Northern Hemisphere at all, like the Proteaceae, the Hemoderaceae, and the Myrtaceae. And I've just chosen those three, but there are many others. Um, but what you might do, therefore, is look at the many different genera that are, there are in the, in the Proteaceae and say, well, are there any patterns? Are there any typical Protea shapes? Well, here they are. Here's some of them anyway. On the left-hand corner there, top left-hand corner, is a Banksia being pollinated by a honey eater. And then another member, a nice Pogon. That was, by the way, the most beautiful grey flower I've ever photographed. 
And then the one here, Hakia, Hakia Victoria. And Hakia Victoria it, it, the, um, shows these wonderful vivid colors and none of those are the flowers, they're all bracts. And so it goes on and you could take Grevillea, for instance, here with its, um, it, what looks as though it's been wired by a British telecoms technician with the occasional things sticking out there. But this is pollinated by birds. So the, the extension here is to allow the bird to receive the pollen and they're actually called in Australian pollen presenters. So you've got a long filament here, a blob on the end with some pollen and the pollen goes onto the bird just in the normal way. So you'd expect that to be an anther and a filament, wouldn't you? Well, you'd be wrong because it's a style and stigma. We've got here the female plant presenting the pollen. It makes no sense. A lot of the rules that we've learned in Britain don't seem to apply in Australia at all. And there, but there are other uh, genera which seem to have some patterns. And one of those is one we're familiar with because we do have eucalyptus plants growing in Britain. So this is what a eucalyptus bud looks like when it's about to flower. It has a little hat. When it doffs its hat, it produces a flower that looks something like this. This is eucalyptus borocopinensis, and it produces white flowers. And an awful lot of eucalyptus flowers are white. They tend to flower at the top of eucalyptus trees, many of which are very tall. So if you don't have binoculars, you don't realize that it's actually in flower. But the smaller ones you can see, and you can also find that are yellow ones, uh, like Eucalyptus pressiana and Rupert's, um, Eucalyptus caesia, which are pink and you can get red ones as well. And there's an awful lot that do look like that. So in that family, thank goodness, there is a, a sort of morphology that you can understand, but you won't be surprised to find there are exceptions. And here's Eucalyptus macrocarpa, that flower there is bigger than the biggest dinner plate you've got in your collection. The, the, the leaves are huge and the whole thing does not look like any of the other eucalyptus trees. But it is a eucalyptus. And if you stand well back, you can see that the flower itself perhaps slightly resembles those much smaller flowers on the other eucalyptus species. So perhaps you can excuse that, say, yes, OK, I can see the similarity there. But not all of them are like that. And we have even exceptions that are quite startling in the eucalyptus genus. genus. And that one is actually a bud. It's a bud of a single flower looking like a three-dimensional jester's hat. And here's the fruit. And the fruit looks like something from outer space. And they're both of the eucalyptus sinuosus, the octopus mallee. And uh, obviously the octopus mallee named because of these long red arms here. So what on earth does the flower look like if that's the bud well it looks like a huge exploding green firework in a tree and it's an absolutely magnificent flower um, and this is all these photographs have been taken by terry dunham of the wildflower society of western australia um, and they're very happy to have us uh, learn about their absolutely wonderful flora and i can't i would love to see that one but it looks nothing like the others it isn't part of that pattern finding that we were hoping to find i mentioned early on that the one of, this is one of the areas which has um, a lot of pollination by birds and that's a photograph I managed to take of the banks are being pollinated by a honey eater but if you get down there are quite a lot of herbal sort of sized plants two or three um, feet tall and if you get down to eye level with them they look very strange indeed because they've adapted to be pollinated by birds and if you were at eye level with this one it really does look like a triffid coming to get you with green teeth those green teeth though are anthers ready to put pollen on an incoming bird. And if you can just about make it, you can see a tiny, tiny little bit of here. That is the style and the stigma waiting to receive the pollen. The bird's attracted to this red bit here and it tries to get the, the nectar from inside. And 95% uh, of this, Ang Anigosanthus manglesii, uh, are pollinated by birds. Very, very few are pollinated by insects indeed. And here's an example of it happening. This is a wonderful photograph because this happens only in a few seconds. A bird comes along and takes the nectar and flies off. And this is the tall kangaroo paw, which can be up to six or seven feet tall. And here we've got the anthers depositing pollen on the bird's head. And we now know that different members of this genus will deposit the pollen in different places. So one species it will be here, another one it'll be here, another one it'll be here, another one it'll be here. And when the bird flies to another plant, um, the pollen will be in the right place to be received by the stigma. The bird and the plants have evolved together in that cooperative way that we often find. 
in addition to confuse things, you've got you've got plants which aren't pollinated by birds, but look like birds. And here we have um, from the Pilbara, which is um, the sort of middle of, of Western Australia and quite dry, we've got the Crotillaria cunninghamii, the green bird flower. And it's a member of Fabaceae, so you'd expect it to look like a pea flower. But really, you can see some similarities to a pea flower, but this is what people mostly see in it, like a whole load of green birds crowded climbing up the stem. Interestingly, its habitat is arid, um, useless land. When I say useless land, it's useless land. It's the land it really likes is no good for development of houses, it's no good for development of factories, it's no good for mining, and so it's actually not threatened at all because um, it, really likes, uh, it really likes to be a, uh, away from where mankind likes to go. Cross your fingers when you say that because we humans are capable of causing destruction on all kinds of scales. And the Pilbara itself, of course, is the centre of mining in Australia and where Australia learns an awful, earns an awful lot of its wealth. The other thing that can happen in a, a country like Australia, which has been drying for hundreds of thousands of years, is that the plants have evolved to do something that's very awkward for the British botanists. Because if we take this structure here, at one time in the distant past, there was a leaf there. There was a leaf here. But it's evolved in Divisia decurrens to, to lose the leaf completely so that it doesn't lose water through transpiration. And now it's just got some chlorophyll in this thing that looks like a thorn, but actually it's called a phyllode. It's the remnant. It's the modified leaf stalk, stalk or petiole, and that's all that remains of it. And it's just to, at the very end of it, it's got a tiny little thorn, little hard bit, so that if you get very close to, uh, it will stab you as well. You've got these very obvious pea flowers growing all the way up it and very distinctive fruits on it. But other than that, you haven't got what we tend to rely upon in Britain, and that is a leaf shape to help you identify it. I mean, we have not only do we uh, uh, use leaves, we've got a whole um, we've got a whole set of descriptors, haven't we, for leaves? We call leaves chordate to say they're heart shaped or sagittate, arrow shaped. We describe their edges as serrate or crenate, and those sort of descriptions apply in countries where there's reasonable amount of water and the leaves are plentiful. But here we've got a drying continent and many of the plants have evolved to have very, very shortened leaves, very small leaves, spikes instead of leaves. And so it doesn't really apply. And our skills in leaf identification aren't that much good. But, but what does come to our rescue is a thing created by um, Western Australian botanists, and that's this superb database which is available to everybody online. And for many of the plants, they've got pictures and they have distribution maps, they've got descriptions of the distribution, a, a very brief description of the plant itself. But the distribution is very important because an awful lot of plants in, in uh, Australia are geographically very distinct. So if you were to find what you thought was a divisia decurrence growing around about here, for instance, the chances are that it wouldn't be what you thought it was because it's a very unlikely to be outside its range. In addition to that, they list not only all the plants which have been described, that is Divisia decurrens, but the ones that haven't been described with phrase names. So if we take one down here, Grevillea spur, ocean reef, that's a phrase name and uh, there's the reference to it, presumably the person who first of all uh, discovered it. Um, and at some time, we hope that somebody will be able to go and do the necessary work and give it a proper name. But until then, these names are all listed. So the listed, the, 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 in this database, they've listed not only the, uh, the published names, but the unpublished names and all what they call the weeds as well. There are about 14,000 species on this database. It really is very comprehensive. If you are a fan of uh, keys, They've got keys for you as well, and they are really good looking. They've got keys which are interactive and they've got diagrams and, and, and photos as well. So really, um, you've got everything you could possibly want from try helping you to identify what is a, an extremely complex flora and one that's very different from one uh, that, you, uh, that you've come across before. This means that really, when you're, when you're going abroad, you can, take, um, you can take your skills with you and in the Northern Hemisphere, quite a number of them will apply. And in the Southern Hemisphere, in places like Australia, you can expect them not to apply so much. But if you've got help from the local bot botanists, 
then really you can make some progress. And of course, plants are still being discovered. And here's one which published on the 24th of June, 2021. And these people, Andrew Brown and Ryan Phillips, managed to find an orchid which is new to science. Canadinia multiplex is named because this is the labellum of the orchid here, and these little lumps on it are called cali, and it's got many of them, so they've said called it multiplex. The bulbonet spider orchid is actually not terribly far from Perth itself, the centre of population in Western Australia, and they discovered a new orchid to science. That must be very exciting, I would have thought. As well as um, the keys and the database and the books that you've got, um, there's a new thing that's come along in, in recent years, and that is people have devoted uh, pages on social media like Twitter and Facebook to botanical identification. So here's one in the Western Australian Wildflower Society's Facebook page. And somebody said, I found this pretty little thing at Ellisbrook. I would love an identification if possible. And the first, this is the first comment here. I'm going with Daniela Revoluta. And people make their comments. They just put them in. And so I offered, I said, I think it's Stipandra glauca, which is blind grass. And the reason I did that is because it's actually a very common plant. And so it's extremely likely that somebody who wants an identification will find a common plant. And that's what everybody agreed. In the end, a lot of people made contributions to it. And the consensus was in the end, yes, it was Stipandra glauca. We've got things in Britain that are exactly the same. And uh, if you publish a plant, you know, a reasonable picture of a plant, say something like uh, red campion, um, Silene dioica, and you publish that during the, the main season, um, May and June, uh, you could well find that it's been identified within a matter of minutes. And you can often find somebody posts it and said, I'm lovely, I'd love to know the identification of this plant. And somebody then will say, Silene dioica, red campion. And somebody else will write afterwards, oh, you've beaten me to it. And that tells you something else. Not only is it the expert botanists who are doing the identification, but it's the expert botanists with good typing skills that are getting in first. And that has become um, a very, very useful way of identifying flowers. And in Britain, uh, we've got some botanical, uh, we've got some pages which are devoted to this, and they've got some of our very, very best botanists on them. So even when you, when you post stuff that's quite abstruse, it's got a good chance of being identified. So there we have it. Some of your plant, some of your skills will translate when you go abroad. Some of them you will get so far and no further, like the astragalus in Turkey. Um, in Australia, you could be completely baffled as I went in, as I was when I first went in 2007, and then suddenly find there are an awful lot of resources to help you with what is one of the um, most complex floras that you could come across from, from Britain, Britain's point of view, because the flowers are so very different. But nevertheless, you could make progress. But the whole point about it is, it's absolutely glorious seeing these new plants, these plants that you've never seen before in your life. And it's great to find out what they are. So I hope you've, I hope you've got gained something from that very quick tour of how to do um, plant identification abroad. And that is the end of my talk. So thanks very much for listening.